Let's all stand together. We're gonna have to sing loud this morning. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains move. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let you pour in your wall. Mercy, triumph, 
They're blessed. Amen. We all have our own idea of what it means to be blessed, though, right? What about in the United States of America? You think, as a whole, what do you think people think it means to be blessed? It's different, isn't it? Does it mean blessed are those who have a good job, a big family, a nice house? I mean, yes, you may be blessed, right? But Maybe you're blessed if you had a happy life, a trouble-free life, that you accomplish much. Sounds like United States, right? So far. That you live a long life, you're well-respected. Are you blessed if you win the lottery? Well, lots of people would say yes, right? Are you blessed if you're smart? Are you blessed if you're safe? Sometimes we confuse that, right? Are we blessed if we're safe? What does Matthew 5, 4 say? Might be surprising. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That doesn't sound like anything I listed on the list. Yeah. It's not even close. Do you think in the United States, anyone would say, like as a country motto, blessed are you who mourn? I don't know if you could even twist anybody's arm and get them to think that. I would imagine that even a lot of people in the church, if they didn't know that verse, if you said, blessed are those who mourn, they'd be like, I don't know. Am I blessed if I mourn? But that's what he says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, up to a certain extent, we agree wholeheartedly. We don't mind the little character builder moments, right? There's things in our life that are hard, and there's sorrow, and it's grief, and it's hard, but we say, oh, that's just a little character builder moment. That was annoying, but we'll laugh about it later, right? We've heard that. Uh, that really wasn't fun, but we're going to laugh about it, you know, like maybe in a year, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, whatever. We'll laugh about it. But when a teenager is lying in the intensive care after a serious crash, you don't sit in the waiting room and say, yeah, we'll laugh about this later. But that's what it's like to mourn, right? So how can we be blessed if we mourn? 
the question for today. How can we be blessed if we mourn? To sum it up in a little bit, it's like this. In surprising ways, suffering makes room in our spirit for us to know and experience the blessing of God's peace and presence. You hear that? Suffering. Without suffering, we simply cannot know the comfort of God. If we don't suffer, we can't know the comfort of God. In mourning, we experience the blessing of God's presence. Think about it. It's the little kid who falls down and skins his knee and goes to his mother, and the mother cannot magically fix his knee, but the mother can hold the child and be presence for the child, and the child feels better. That's what God's like. But without mourning, you can't do it. I did a series on Job, I don't know how many months ago, and it was the same way. Until Job had great, great suffering, until everything was taken away from him, until everything he thought was important was gone, he didn't know God the same way. Then later in Job 42, 5, he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He saw God in a new way after he, after he suffered and mourned greatly. He saw God in a completely new way. And that's what we want, right? I can't say that I wake up every morning saying, I hope that I get to mourn today. <laughs> but we can agree that what Job said is true. Until you need God's comforting, until you need his peace, until you need his presence. You don't feel in the same way. If you just walk around life every day, just doing normal things, and you don't have those, you don't have it. See, to sum it up, when we suffer, we mourn. When we mourn, we are comforted by God. That's why blessed are those who mourn. And it goes along with this, you have to get to the end of yourself, to this place where only God can help you. And then you begin to experience the love of God. So in what ways can we mourn? And that's what I'm talking about this morning. And there's, there's three easy ones here. One, mourning for others. This is the most common one, right? You go to a funeral, you go to the hospital, you're mourning for someone else. Now, different people have different ideas about this, depending on if you're a man or a woman, or if you're a stoic, or if you're emotional. Everybody has a different idea, right? Some people, you don't see them crying. Some people, you see them bawling. Some people hold it in, right? Some people don't want to mourn. Some people put it off. What do you therapists say? If you don't let it out, it's going to get you eventually, right? Not just therapists. Lots of people say you have to deal with that. Well, I mean, think about what we just talked about at the beginning. When you mourn and suffer and you're able to get closer to God. What happens if you go to a funeral and you don't deal with it and you bury it and you don't mourn? You're not going to experience blessing from God. I mean, you can and he can bless you in other ways, but in the way that I'm talking about, if you don't allow yourself to suffer and mourn, if you just push it back there and don't deal with it, then you're missing out on the opportunity for God to comfort you and for God to walk alongside you because you're saying, I, I don't need help, I don't need anything, I'm fine. Nothing happened, it's all good. You see, sooner or later we stop running. Sooner or later we stop running from the things we have to grieve. Usually because we've run out of places to run to. We finally let the tears flow. And that's when we find the missing strength. But the twist is, is that it's not our strength at all. It's the power of God's arms wrapped around us. It's his strength. And at the end of me, when I can't comfort myself, when I can't deal with it, that's when we find the richest blessings. See, mourning isn't a no big deal thing. It's not a, it's an okay thing if you're into it thing. It's not a think positively and it will go away thing. It's a necessary thing, and it's a very good, beneficial thing. It's a blessing thing. Just like Job, if you grieve and you mourn, then you can feel the presence of God in a way that you, you don't in other stages of your life. You just can't. If you say, I can handle it, and I don't need anything, and it's fine, then you don't experience the richest blessings that you can get. That's mourning for others. Now, there's other ways to mourn. Another one, mourning our actions. Ever done something stupid? At least once a day. <laughs> maybe twice a day. Maybe more, if you're honest. But we can mourn our actions, right? When we were kids, you hear your parents say, go down, sit over there, and think about what you did. Why do they say that? It's 
so you can think about what you did, realize what you did wrong, right? Because if they don't, if, if your child doesn't admit that they did anything wrong, they're not going to learn anything, right? They're just thinking, I'm going to sit in this stupid corner. I don't know why. And they're not going to change, right? So they have to sit there long enough until they start to think about what they did. And it's almost like the parents have a sixth sense. And they're like, well, I don't think they dealt with it yet. They can stay in the corner. But if you don't admit guilt, then you can't learn. What about adults? Are we any better? No, same thing. But what do we do? Do we sit in the corner? No, we make excuses. Well, I was in the work on time because there was a train. When I left my house, not in time to get there anyway, and then the train made me more late, right? But we make excuses. Anything else, we, we make tons of excuses. And when we do that, we don't learn, right? We don't admit we did anything wrong, and so we can't mourn. We can't mourn our actions if we don't think we did anything wrong or we don't want to miss. And so, in doing that, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but we miss out on the blessings of mourning our actions and having God walk alongside of us. It's that simple. You think it's no big deal. Well, uh, it'll be fine tomorrow. But if you don't mourn your actions, you don't get the blessings. If we fail to acknowledge our sin, then there can be no mourning. And without mourning, there can be no confession. And without confession, we miss the blessing of God's forgiveness and grace. Think about that. Think about the forgiveness and grace God gives us compared to everyone else. Because when my wife forgives me, She's not perfect either, so it's a different kind of forgiveness and grace. She's more perfect than I am. Let's get that clear. <laughs> but when God forgives me, he's perfect in every single way. And his forgiveness and grace is greater than anything anyone else can give me. But if I don't admit that I sinned, if I don't confess to him, then I, I don't get that blessing. See, when we don't admit that we messed up, we don't acknowledge our need for forgiveness and grace, and then we miss out on God. It's that simple. We need God because he's the only one that can forgive us, even when we don't deserve it. And his forgiveness and his grace are bigger and better than anything we could ever imagine. And we can't get it on our own. Now, it, it hurts to admit we're wrong. I know it does me, for sure. Ask my children. And confession can be painful. It can. But think about it. On the other side of confession, there's a feeling like cool water rushing over you on a blazing hot day. Like I've been carrying this around and it's hot and it's sticky and it's a mess. And, oh, I'm just hiding it. I don't admit it. And I finally admit it. And it's like, <sighs> it's great. And there's no way to get that blessing without the mourning that comes before it. You don't mourn it, the action that you did, ask for forgiveness, confess. You can't get that cool rush of water over you. You can't get that shower when you haven't showered in a long time feeling. You can't, anything like that. You can't get that, I've been working hard and work's been stressful, and then you get to the weekend and you're like, ah, without the mourning part, you can't get the feeling. And there's nothing else like it. And the last one, and we, we don't think about this often, three, mourning our lack of control. Think about that, mourning our lack of control. Anybody ever wanted to give up junk food or maybe snacks after dinner or anything like that, but you can't, it's hard? Steve, do you still eat cookies? Yep. <laughs> Me too. Do I still eat stuff after dinner when I'm probably not that hungry? Yes. You know that feeling that you want to, but you just can't? It's like you don't have control. Sometimes you're making excuses like, oh, it doesn't really matter. Even though we know we want to stop and we can't. That's a lack of control. And sometimes I mourn it. Want so bad to exercise and get in shape and be better, but you can't get yourself to do it? I mourn that. Some people want to quit smoking, but they don't have the power on their own to stop. They mourn not having control. It's not about thinking I should stop, or I shouldn't do that because it's bad, or I shouldn't do that because it's against the law. It's about desperately wanting to change and not being able to. It's about sinning and feeling so bad about it 
and never wanting to happen again. Think about that. That's what mourning is. Not the sitting and then feel bad and be like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's like really feeling inside yourself. I, it's like the Apostle Paul. I do not do what I want to do, and I do do what I do not want to do. There's no control. We need to mourn that. We need to come to the end ourselves and realize, I can't control this. See, we need to get to the point where we have no power in order to experience God's grace and forgiveness. No power. Is that a fun place to be? No. But that's where we need to get. Do you know the famous story in the Bible? I call it, the wind, even the wind and the waves obey him. And it's just one of the most amazing things. Like if I go somewhere I'm on a missions trip, or whatever, I go to a guest, be a guest at a youth group, and they say, hey, why don't you go up and share something with us? And I'm like, I don't have anything ready. Then I immediately go to Matthew 8, 23 through 27, because I just, it's one of those stories that it amazes me so much that I can't help but talk about it. Like, I don't have to have a script or anything. They, we don't have to read it, but just so you, it's Matthew 8, 23 through 27, but it's where the disciples are in the boat, and they go away from the shore, and they're by themselves because Jesus decided to stay back for now. And all of a sudden, there's a big storm. And one of them, he's not in the boat. The other one, he's in the boat sleeping. Either way, I feel like he's not helping me, right? <laughs> anyway, the big storm comes up. And eventually, they find he's there and he's sleeping or whatever. And they're all freaked out because Jesus is with them. And they feel invincible normally. But now there's this storm. And if, if, you're not, if you've never been on the water on Lake Erie or the ocean, you just don't understand. If you're in this little boat and there's waves that are 15 feet high or whatever, you are powerless. Literally, there's nothing you can do. You can hold onto the boat tighter. You can hang onto your life jacket. It doesn't matter. The feeling of, first of all, I'm going to fall out of this boat. Next of all, I'm going to be trying to swim and keep my head above water in 15 feet high waves or worse or whatever. I like to think that I'm a pansy enough that if they were three foot waves and I was out of the boat, I'd probably be pretty scared still that I can't control anything. I don't know what's going on. But here's this thing. And what happens then? They shake them away. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Look at those waves. They're huge. We can't do a thing. We're stuck here. We're going to die. Don't you even care? You're taking a nap. That's how we feel in life a lot of times. Something really bad's going on, and we're like, why are you taking a nap? I'm down here suffering. But only they were there with him physically, and they're like, come on, can't you do anything? And he's kind of like, it's like when my kids bug me on my Sunday afternoon nap. Can't you make your own food? Can't you do this? Can't you whatever? And he's like, Okay, stop waves. Stop waves. Like it's no big deal because it's not for him. But they've never seen that before. Can't do anything. Totally stuck. And he wakes up from a nap and does more, you know what they say, more before 5 a.m. than I can do in a whole day by snapping his fingers. And the storm's gone and the waves are gone and it's calm and they're all sitting in the boat kind of going like this. We don't know what's going on. And one of them says that famous line. He was amazing. He didn't say all of this, but he heals lepers. He made the demon come out of the God. He did all that stuff. But dude just told the wind and waves to stop, and they did. Wow. See, the problem is, in order to experience that kind of power from God, we need to be in that situation first that we can't handle on our own. And to be honest, we avoid those situations at all costs. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing. I'm just saying our self-preservation says don't go near any situation that's like that. And I'm not telling you to go walk into it on purpose. Don't go walk in traffic to see what's going to happen. Because I don't think that's God's list of things to do today. Probably not. It's not cars. But we avoid those situations at all costs. When that's where we see the real power of God. Because if we can handle it on our own, what do we need Him for? Which, that's probably the American motto. Well, I don't really see the need for God. I got this handled. I got a house. I got a family. I have three cars and a boat and 
a dog and two cats. What do I need that for? <laughs> to be honest, how often do we even curse God for allowing us to be in those situations? God, how could you let this happen? Come on, don't you care? How'd you let me be in this situation? It's your fault. So not only do we not want to be in those situations, we yell at God when he allows us to be in those situations, and half the time we don't even let him fix it then. Because we're so mad, and we're so angry, we're not even really mourning yet, we're just angry. I don't know what the stages of grief are, but I know anger is one of them, and that seems to be the one we pull out on God all the time. There's the, and I don't have the terms for it, the I don't care too, like, but mourning, actual mourning, allows us to experience God's comfort and presence and grace. Those are simple words. You can look them up in the dictionary. Comfort and presence and grace. And they have limited meanings, but when you attach them to God and you attach them to Jesus, comfort and presence and grace are bigger than you can even imagine. And those are the things that we lock out of our lives all the time because we won't grieve and mourn our actions. We won't grieve and mourn our lack of control. We won't even mourn others because we would just rather not feel the pain. When we avoid all those things, we're not coming to the end of our own power and going to his. We're holding on to our own power. I feel like if I could go to this room, if I could go in the high school gym, if I could go to the airport, I feel like I'm the biggest abuser of this. I feel like I can handle anything. I feel like everything's no big deal. I don't get real high, I don't get real low. I got this. That's what I feel like all the time. And it's a strength in times, and it's a big weakness at times, because I'm not going to get those blessings if I don't need God. If I don't need Jesus to help me, if, I don't, if I'm not like that woman who was bleeding for years and years and years and years and just thought, if I can crawl through this crowd amongst people's ankles and calves, and if I can just touch him, I'm going to be healed. And if I don't see the need for that, then I'm not going to look at him like that or feel that kind of power. I'm just going to go on with my whole home life feeling blessed because I am, but I'm not blessed in the way that it says in Matthew 5.4. Because I'm warned. What if I told you here's a list of ten ways that you can be blessed? And we decide, well, nine of them, I really don't like those. And we're left with one thing. And of course we're going to get mad at God because we're not going to feel blessed all the time. Or we confuse other things for blessing and they're not really a blessing because they're actually taking us away from those other nine things. When we say, this is all I want, and we ignore that, we miss out on God's comfort and presence and grace. And it's short and simple today, but let's put it this way. When we get to the end of ourselves, when we can't handle the grief on our own, when we can't believe what we did was wrong, when we realize that we can't control our own actions or the actions of others, then we make room to experience the power of God. I come on my knees down before you bringing all that I am longing only to know you seeking your face and not only your hand I find you embracing me just as I And I lift these songs to you and you alone As I sing to you in my praises make your home To my audience of one You are Father and you are Son As your spirit flows free let it find within me a heart that beats to praise you. And now, chill.
costume 